Hi everyone, thanks for watching this video. In this talk, I will discuss some of our uh, works in the direction of resource efficient machine learning. Uh, I'm Pratik Jain and I work at Google Research India. Uh, most of this work was done while I was a research scientist at Microsoft Research and it is joint work with uh, various uh, colleagues from Microsoft Research, including Harsha Simhadri, Manik Varma, Ajay Manchepalli, Oindrala Saha, Don Dennis, Aditya Kusupati, Arun Sugala, and various other interns and research fellows at Microsoft Research. So uh, uh, in today's world, we are uh, surrounded by devices. And by now, pretty much everybody is convinced that we can make these devices much more efficient and much more powerful by bringing machine learning and artificial intelligence into them. So let's look at uh, how our current capabilities scale uh, in terms of infusing AI into these devices versus the compute spectrum of the device. So on the leftmost side here, we have our cloud and PC devices, which have uh, a lot of um, power. Uh, and that means that uh, we can uh, train and deploy largest of the AI models that we have. As we go towards the right, things become more interesting. So when we look at what we call large edge devices, so these are typically your mobile phones, smart uh, watches uh, or smart TVs. So on them, uh, the amount of memory and compute that you have available is much, much smaller than say PC class device, but still it's reasonable, say uh, greater than 100 megabyte as well as um, a processor which has say one gigahertz uh, um, clock frequency. So for these devices now, it's very difficult to train the model models natively on these devices, but still uh, for fairly large models, we should be able to deploy them on these devices and infer with it. Still, there are several interesting questions in this domain, and that's why a lot of community is focusing in this area, and there are several frameworks for deploying machine learning models on these large edge devices like uh, TensorFlow Lite, AWS Greengrass, Azure IoT. But beyond these large edge devices also, there's a large compute spectrum of devices that we call tiny edge devices. These devices are typically your battery powered um, microcontrollers that are attached to sensors. They might have few uh, kilobyte or say megabyte of RAM, might have very weak processors, like let's say with uh, 100 megahertz processing uh, power. But these devices sit closest to the data. They are observing the data at its highest fidelity because they are observing data right from the sensor. And that's why uh, they can uh, do some very interesting things. If we can enable machine learning or artificial intelligence on these devices, we can enable some very powerful uh, scenarios. And in past few years, there has been a fair bit of focus uh, in this area as well. So at Microsoft, we were working on this, uh, this library called EdgeML, which addresses uh, machine learning algorithms and even deployment framework for such uh, tiny solution, uh, tiny devices. Uh, similarly, like, you know, uh, uh, TensorFlow Lite has a TensorFlow Lite micro version, which also addresses machine learning for uh, these tiny devices. Esteem has its own framework. So there are a lot of new frameworks that are coming up uh, to ensure that we can de deploy machine learning algorithms on these tiny devices natively. Okay. So in this talk, mostly we will focus on uh, machine learning algorithms that are specifically designed for these tiny devices. Um, but before going there, let's just uh, look at uh, um, a few specific things like what type of devices are we talking about? Why should we care about these devices? And finally, like, you know, we will get to the meat of the talk, which is how will we really enable machine learning on these devices? So uh, we are like, you know, uh, targeting a large uh, uh, spectrum of devices. So like, you know, you want to come up with machine learning algorithms that are powerful and can be deployed on say mobile phones as well as smartwatches. But at the same time, we also want to go all the way down to in this uh, compute hierarchy to devices like uh, M0 plus class microcontroller, um, which are really, really tiny. In fact, uh, here, this is a golf ball and uh, this is the device itself. So like the form factor can be really, really small and uh, they might sort of you know be able to provide only say 2 kilobyte of ram uh, 32 kilobyte of flash and very weak say 48 megahertz processor so we want to sort of target even devices like this hmm? um 
Now, why do we really care about these devices? Why do we want to enable machine learning on these devices? Can't we basically just take all the data that is being generated by the sensors and use these devices as just like, you know, dumb gateway devices that are sending all the data to some other more powerful gateway device or to the cloud? Uh, well, that's a reasonable approach in a variety of settings, but in a lot of settings, uh, this might not work out. And most of the times, like the overriding principle, why uh, this type of approach of sending all the data to cloud uh, might not work uh, for such devices is because in these devices, communication can be much more expensive than computation. Now, how you measure the cost of communication and computation uh, that can uh, that can have various sort of meanings and can vary from situation to situation. Let me try to sort of you know give a couple few examples uh, which will hopefully convince you why um, deploying machine learning devices natively on these tiny devices is important. So as I mentioned, like you know, uh, if you are say uh, communicating uh, data, then it can be more expensive than compute. This expense can come in form of say privacy of the user data. That is, if you are communicating uh, so much of data to cloud or to gateway devices, especially over unsecured channel, it can be quite risky. Uh, so to preserve privacy, you might want to sort of do most of your computation locally on these devices. Similarly, battery can be a very very important factor here. Uh, these most of these devices are uh, battery controlled. So so if you're sending uh, a lot of data, that tends to drain the battery much, much faster than doing the computation locally. Uh, latency can another be an important factor that is like, you know, doing computation locally might be much more efficient in terms of uh, latency uh, compared to sending the data to cloud, letting cloud do the computation and then getting back the computation from cloud. Uh, then bandwidth in many scenarios can be quite critical or can be an expensive thing. Uh, and finally, cost of the device itself might increase significantly if you are going to send all the data to cloud. So because of all these reasons, um, in a variety of settings, uh, you might want to do computation completely locally. So one such uh, very critical application area is in the domain of wellness centric wearables, where uh, due to privacy constraints or privacy worries, you don't want to send the data over uh, or to cloud. Again, these uh, wearables will tend to have very small devices that are battery operated uh, and the amount of battery that you can put on the wearables will be very small. So battery is a key constraint. Latency is also a key constraint. There are various other similar domains like say smart meter, smart city, smart appliances, uh, so let's maybe controlling your appliances through voice or through vision uh, centric signals there again uh, latency battery privacy can be very very critical aspects and that's why uh, doing this machine learning inference computation on the device locally is really critical now, when we talk about making this AI inference uh, to be more efficient, uh, there are a, like this efficiency can be measured in a variety of manner, right? So one such measure of efficiency is the number of parameters that are there in the uh, model that we learn, right? And in general, uh, most of your typical methods will give you a accuracy versus number of parameters curve. That is, as you increase the number of parameters, your accuracy should typically go up, right? Uh, so Similarly, like you know, your method uh, might want to trade off uh, computation for accuracy. Uh, in some settings, peak memory usage can be quite critical, and in fact, it can be quite different than the number of parameters your model has. And um, again, you might want to trade off this peak memory usage against accuracy. Uh, trading of energy consumption per inference against accuracy is another like you know important criteria. So. When you want to deploy machine learning on these really tiny microcontrollers, especially, you would need to worry about uh, all these four fronts. And in fact, uh, some of these um, things might be much more critical and much more hard constraints. So, for example, peak memory usage tends to be a very, very hard constraint on microcontrollers that tend to have very small uh, memory in general. And that's why you would need to restrict the memory usage to be, say, less than 200 kilobyte on an M4 class microcontroller while trying to optimize is the amount of compute or an amount of energy your inferences uh, inference requires right? uh, and uh, already like you know um, uh, the you need to worry about all these trading of all these uh, 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 efficiency parameters and then you need to deploy your final learned solution on the microcontroller which is very difficult because uh, 
because these microcontrollers are typically run bare metal they do not have any operating system and that's where uh, in recent past a lot of work has been done to ensure that we can do this deployment on these uh, microcontrollers in a much more easy manner for example google has this framework called tensorflow light micro where you can uh, write uh, your uh, code uh, or the inference code in 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 a relatively high level language in a tensorflow like uh, type of language and then the goal of this framework would be to come up with uh, binaries that can be uh, burnt on uh, onto your device directly with very small runtime so uh, now let's come to how we can um, come up with machine learning algorithms or machine learning models that can be really deployed on these tiny devices. So here, uh, the community overall has taken three types of approaches. So one type of approach is to compress existing architectures. Uh, so, uh, and like, you know, there has been a long uh, list of work in this domain, like deep compression, XNOR net, and various other quantization or sparsity inducing uh, techniques. Then another line of work which is very popular is to search for better architectures by basically taking the standard architectures, but then trying to tweak them and trying to um, to sort of ensure that the number of parameters you require in each uh, layer of your architecture is minimized so that again the total cost uh, of your inference goes down. And then the third approach is to design new architectures, new blocks, new neural networks for these tiny devices natively and there has been again fair bit of work in the direction for example mobile net squeeze net are uh, quite important example in this direction and our line of work which is around um, HML and like you know machine learning for these resource custom devices and uh, that also takes primarily this approach that is we are trying to come up with completely new architectures or blocks which are almost as accurate as the more standard neural network architectures and neural network blocks but they are uh, requirement their memory usage or their compute requirement can be significantly smaller now when you really want to deploy a very powerful solution on these really tiny devices then you cannot rely on just one of these approaches in general you will need to uh, basically combine all these approaches that is you will need to come up with a neural network architecture which is dependent on these very efficient blocks then you need to do some sort of architecture search to ensure that uh, mm, uh, you do not sort of overpay or you do not use more parameters or more uh, like expensive layers than what is really necessary and then finally you would want to uh, compress the the final model that you come up with using uh, quantization techniques as well as by using uh, other sparsity inducing techniques so as i mentioned that our line of uh, our work has been a uh, lot more in uh, designing the key building blocks for this efficient neural networks and as part of this work we have come up with a series of algorithms or series of blocks uh, like bonsai proton fast jaranan and aranan pool um so uh, just to give a high level overview uh, bonsai and proton can be thought of as uh, your standard uh, supervised learning methods um, with uh, already learned features or representation. So you can think that like if your neural network, if you have a feed forward layer, you can try to replace that feed forward layer with bonsai or proton. Or if you basically learn some representation and you're using some gradient booster decision tree or support vector machine on top of um, those methods, then instead of that, you can use uh, these uh, much more efficient uh, versions that we have called bonsai and proton, which in at least a variety of benchmarks you've seen, uh, still preserve the accuracy of the models now if you are working with the uh, time series data or uh, sensor data um, then typically you would want to use recurrent neural networks and there a standard approach is to use lstm plus gru and if you are in like an always on setting where your data is streaming then you would need to use some sort of windowing uh, of the data and you apply lstm or grus on top of it to to provide your predictions with the with the uh, with the window of data that you have now instead of that we have come up with some new techniques like fast grnn shrnn meirnn which are able to make these uh, lstm gru blocks to be significantly more cheaper and also ensures that uh, you don't have to do a lot of recomputation when you are doing this sliding window uh, type of architecture 
And then finally, uh, uh, if you are you, you have let's say a convolution neural network based method for your computer vision task, uh, then we can make um, make that architecture much more efficient in terms of peak memory usage by introducing this new uh, pooling uh, layer called RNN pool. So in this talk, I will not be able to go over uh, all these uh, algorithms or all these blocks, but let me give a very high level overview of um, the bonsai and proton and what uh, they are able to achieve as well as about fast GRNN. And then in the remaining part of the talk, we will mostly focus on RNN pool and how it can ensure that we can have computer vision models deployed on really, really tiny devices. So Bonsai and Proton, as I mentioned, are essentially supervised learning methods. They can be thought of as replacing your uh, feed forward network. And uh, on a variety of benchmarks, we have compared Bonsai and Proton, uh, which are given by um, red and blue bar against these standard uh, state of the art methods like uh, gradient booster decision trees, k nearest neighbors, uh, multiple hidden layer neural networks. So here on the top, we plot accuracy of these methods on different data sets. And on the bottom, we have the model size of these methods. So as we can see that the accuracy of Bonsai and Proton can be fairly competitive. And in fact, in some cases, even higher than these uh, state of the art uncompressed methods. But when you look at the model size, our model size is, in some, is restricted to be less than 16 kilobyte, whereas for almost that same accuracy, uh, your neural networks or uh, gradient booster decision trees might require uh, hundreds of megabytes. So we can provide uh, compression of the order of 1000 to 10,000 X uh, without uh, really sacrificing much on accuracy. Now, in this domain of uh, efficient supervised learning, there has been a lot of methods that are designed for um, for compressing uh, these existing techniques. Uh, there are like you know some award-winning uh, methods here, like neural network pruning as well as decision jungle. But here, what we observe is that when you go to really, really tiny model size and really, really tiny uh, peak RAM requirement sizes, like let's say 15 kilobytes or 16 kilobytes, in that situation, uh, proton and bonsai, which are given by this blue and red curve, can be significantly more uh, effective um, in terms of accuracy than uh, all the existing state of the art techniques. So uh, a one line summary of um, basically what we want to talk about here is that if you are using uh, your feed forward networks or you are using gradient booster decision trees or techniques similar to that, and you are struggling to deploy those solutions on, on a, in your budget of memory or latency, then uh, you might want to check out Bonsai and Proton methods, uh, which can uh, in some cases provide compression of the order of 1000X without really sacrificing much on accuracy. So the next sort of uh, block that we have is around recurrent neural networks. So I will give a very high level view of like the results that say a fast JRNN block is able to provide. So as I mentioned, fast JRNN block can be thought of as a replacement for your standard LSTM or GRU blocks. And here again, on a variety of different tasks like keyword uh, detection in audio data, like uh, which we measured on Google 12 and Google 30 data sets, or sentiment analysis on this YEL5 data set or sports activity on this DSA data set or um, or like you know very simple basic image classification tasks like this stylized pixel MNIST data set. So in all these data sets what we observe is that fast JRNN which is represented by the red um, bar here its accuracy is very similar to the state of the art GRU or LSTM. But when you look at the model size, our model size can be 20 to 80x smaller than your GRU and LSTM, which also means that our model, uh, our uh, models are 20 to 80x uh, cheaper in terms of total compute requirement than these standard methods as well. We were able to sort of deploy fast JRNN on these really tiny devices, the type of devices that I showed you earlier. So on those devices, what we observe is that uh, using fast JRNN, we are able to provide uh, predictions on fairly uh, uh, challenging data points uh, in few milliseconds, like let's say in hundreds of milliseconds. But um, but if you want to deploy some of the existing techniques, like say even uh, cheaper techniques like UGRNN, etc., uh, that tends to uh, either require too much inference time or sometimes the model does not even fit on these tiny devices. 
So again, here upshot is that if you are using recurrent neural networks, especially say GRUs or LSTMs, you might want to check out our fast GRNN block, which can be totally into 20 to 80x smaller than GRUs or LSTMs. And in a variety of settings, it is still able to provide accuracy almost at the, at the level of uh, these existing RNN blocks. All right, so in the remaining talk, I will talk um, focus on uh, RNN pool, which is a new pooling operator for your typical convolution neural networks. So RNN pools like main uh, sort of USPs that it is able to reduce the feature map size uh, significantly for your convolution neural networks without uh, a significant loss in accuracy. Now, uh, what that means is that like if we can make the activation map much, much smaller, then uh, your convolution is running on much, much smaller activation map. And that implies that the total compute that you need would also be in general smaller. So we are able to help with both the peak memory usage of uh, this convolution neural network as well as the computation that you need to spend uh, on these uh, neural networks. So uh, one can sort of uh, also show in our we also uh, show in our work that uh, the the improvement that we provide in terms of peak memory usage is provable. That is, there is no like you know simple uh, trick in terms of how computation graph is laid out that you can just uh, avoid paying for uh, some amount of RAM. Like we show that we will be able to. Um, to improve on the minimum RAM requirement that you have, assuming you don't have to do a lot of recompute uh, and still provide a solution whose peak RAM requirement is small and is still almost as accurate as your standard networks. And you have evaluated our solution on a variety of important tasks like object classification, face recognition, product detection, etc. And as I mentioned, on most of these tasks, we observe that our solution is able to provide eight to 10 times reduction in total RAM requirement without significant loss in accuracy. And in some cases, it is able to provide two to five X improvement in the total compute requirement as well. So uh, compute, we, uh, on device computer vision is quite critical in several scenarios. Uh, as I mentioned earlier also, right, that there are several scenarios where you will need to run machine learning natively on tiny devices. In computer vision, these scenarios are uh, quite widespread. So for example, if you have a retail store and if some shelf is empty, you want a camera to just quickly uh, sort of analyze that fact and uh, send that information um, back to the, uh, to the control room that, oh, these shelves are empty and you might want to go and restock them or you might want to sort of you know just put a small camera in your conference room and uh, detect how many people are there in conference room so that maybe you can save energy or um, you can sort of you know plan how your conference room should be scheduled or uh, you can have some sort of analysis of stadium crowd that is how many people are there how maybe lines are there uh, on food counters etc to help with uh, much better experience in stadiums. So the key requirement in all these scenarios uh, is that the devices that we have will be battery operated. They have to be very low cost and you will in most of the cases you will be dealing with very poor internet connectivity, which means that you will need to ensure that the uh, ML model should run natively on these very uh, small devices. Uh, for this vision type of um, uh, solutions, uh, we are thinking of slightly bigger devices than the M0 plus class device that I talked about earlier. Here we are talking mostly about say M4 class microcontrollers, which will typically have a like, you know, uh, Cortex M4 microcontroller with some accelerator. It will typically have say 256 kilobyte of RAM and would have about maybe 200 to 300 megahertz uh, processor. Uh, and note that RAM, RAM tends to be a very key constraint here because you are sort of restricted to about 256 kilobyte of RAM. Now you might say that, oh, what if, if I try to manufacture a chip which has significantly higher amount of RAM? Unfortunately, that is very hard to do because if you try to make the RAMs larger, then your die size increases, uh, which makes the power consumption larger. It increases the cost also. And furthermore, the RAM itself uh, needs to sort of refresh uh, at some frequency, which means that it will also uh, draw significant batteries. So that's why most of the battery powered microcontrollers would have about just a 256 kilobyte of RAM. 
So um, now, like you know, uh, because computer vision solutions are so important, they are used in industry so much. So naturally, there has been a lot of work in compressing these computer vision models. Uh, but most of the work uh, that is done in this model compression has been either in the domain of decreasing model size uh, by pruning or sparsification, or in uh, in terms of decreasing the total number of operations that you are doing. All right, so here uh, there are techniques like depth by separable convolutions or mobile nets. But most of these techniques do not really address the challenge of peak RAM requirement. That is, peak RAM requirement for these models still remain high. Uh, while our focus has been to ensure that we can bring down the peak RAM requirement uh, for these models to be significantly lower by almost an order of magnitude lower. And as a side effect, we also observe that the total amount of compute that we need also goes down significantly. Right. So one might ask that why do we care about this peak RAM requirement for this convolution neural network so much? Why is it that this uh, CNNs or convolution neural network requires so much of working memory or P has so much so high peak RAM requirement? So uh, typically the way a, a CNN work is the following: you take your input image and then you keep on applying these uh, convolution layers to iteratively refine the feature map, right, or the activation map. And intuitively, as you go down this architecture, you are capturing uh, more and more high level uh, concepts in the image. Now, <clears throat> what, what happens is uh, that uh, you typically need a lot of channels uh, or a lot of basically convolution filters to capture all the different um, uh, different type of uh, uh, features that are present in the image. And that means that you cannot really decrease the number of uh, channels uh, significantly. So that means that uh, as you're going over uh, over this convolution neural network and you are slowly decreasing the size of the image, that is uh, the breadth and the width of the image, uh, your number of channels still tend to be fairly large. And at some intermediate level, the size of the image hasn't decreased so much, but the number of channels has increased a lot. And that means that at, po at that point of time, uh, the feature map size is very large. And that's why you might not be able to deploy the solution on uh, really Relatively tiny devices, right? So, for example, on ResNet 18, just I, I uh, just after about uh, three convolution neural network, you get a block of the size of 56 by 56 by 64. If you start with a standard ImageNet image, which is of the size 224 by 224 by 3, so in that situation, now this to store just this 56 by 56 by 64 um, block, you will need ab about 800 kilobyte of memory, whereas our uh, typical devices would support only about 256 kilobyte of memory. So that's why you cannot really uh, deploy such like you know simple ResNet 18 type of architectures on on tiny devices. Now one can say that oh can I come up with some technique so that uh, I can avoid uh, storing so much of um, uh, intermediate data because ultimately we are going from a relatively small image let's say of the size 224 by 224 by 1 or 224 by 225 by 3 to <clears throat> a very small sort of you know uh, feature map. So uh, it's just that the intermediate feature map is large. So can I uh, redo my computation in a way so that I don't have to store the, all this intermediate computation? Can I just do this computation on the fly? And uh, that's a great idea. But what we show is that at least um, in the world of uh, images, you cannot really avoid um, storing these large feature map. That it, until unless you are doing a lot of recompute, we can show formally that you will need to store fair bit of intermediate information. And that means that you cannot really avoid um, uh, avoid having to sort of you know have a large amount of uh, RAM on the chip to deploy these uh, devices. Uh, I will not go in detail of uh, this particular proposition or this particular claim, um, but please please uh, please refer to our paper to uh, to get into more details about uh, this claim. Okay. So um, 
so what can we really do like how can we sort of you know make sure that the intermediate uh, feature map size that we have is small so as i mentioned that in general the number of channels cannot be decreased but can we really decrease uh, the height and um, the breadth and width of the image itself so that that is the number of rows and columns in the image itself so that like you know we will be working on much smaller uh, feature maps so here one uh, typical approach is to use pooling right so pooling is used to sort of um, bring down the size of the feature map and uh, typical pooling operators are some like you know fairly gross aggregators like max pool and average pool uh, max pool takes uh, say a two by two feature map or receptive field and just looks at the maximum value uh, in the two by two patch and outputs that average pool similarly outputs the average right so as you can see that these existing pooling techniques are very sort of um, gross aggregation of the image data and that's why they tend to lose a lot of information they uh, tend to lose a lot of patterns and they end up uh, providing very poor accuracy so you cannot uh, really use this naive pooling operators and that's where rnn pool comes in picture that is rnn pool is able to um, is able to do much more aggressive reduction in the size of the feature map. That is, we can apply RNN pool, uh, pool even on the uh, on the patches or on the receptive field of size four by four or eight by eight, uh, while ensuring that the accuracy remains almost the same. So, how does this operator works? Um, well, uh, the way RNN pool works is that, like you know, it takes these receptive fields or patches of size, let's say four by four, uh, summarizes them into a, a a pixel or a voxel, and you then stride by some amount. You again get a summary of the of the patch and so on, right? So, uh, so you can that's why you can take a large feature map and apply this RNN pool layer and compress that into a much much smaller feature map. And what exactly we do to uh, do this compression? Well, we use uh, four, four recurrent neural networks uh, to summarize this patch of data. That is, if we have, let's say, a four by four um, patch of data uh, or um, uh, four by four patch of the image, we first uh, run a recurrent neural network on each row of, uh, of this uh, patch. And that gives essentially a summary of each row. And, and we then run a recurrent bidirectional recurrent neural network to get a summary of all the rows. Similarly, we run a recurrent neural network on each of the column, and then again we run a bidirectional uh, recurrent neural network to get a summary of um, of all these columns uh, also. And then we just concatenate the summaries that we get from the rows and from the columns into our final summary of this patch, right? So this is, and then like, you know, we again stride by some amount again on the new patch, we will apply these four recurrent neural networks uh, to get the next summary of the patch and so on, right? And here, you, as you can see that RNN pool is um, syntactically equivalent to any pooling operator. So we can apply our recurrent, uh, this RNN pool layer anywhere where you, you are using a pooling layer or where you want to use a pooling layer. Right. So one uh, big question is that what is the recurrent neural network architecture that we use? Because if the recurrent neural network architecture itself is expensive, then you might still end up paying a lot in terms of memory or in terms of compute. And that's where this fast JRNN work that I had earlier mentioned comes in picture that they use fast JRNN to ensure that we are able to come up with a much, much more cheap um, recurrent neural network architecture while ensuring that uh, the accuracy that we get out of a model is still nearly state of the art. So now the question is because like, you know, RNN pool is semantically equivalent to any pooling operator, where do we really use it? Like what are the places where it can help us? So well, as I mentioned, like, you know, because uh, RNN pool is able to capture uh, the structure in the data much better than your standard pooling operators. What we observed is that wherever you apply it, it tends to increase the accuracy by a little bit. But what we observe is that like the most interesting improvement you get is when you apply RNN pool right in the beginning of the image and reduce the size of the feature map or size of the image, because that ensures that uh, that now the end remaining network runs on much, much smaller feature map. And that means that the PRAM requirement as well as compute requirement of the network comes down significantly.
So for example, if we take a dense net and here in this dense net, uh, after about three layers, we have a activation map, which is really large. You cannot really fit it on a, uh, on a microcontroller of the size, let's say M4 class microcontroller. But, uh, but instead of like, you know, running, uh, that's net network like this. What we do is we apply a RNN pool uh, layer right after the first convolution layer, and that ensures that we are able to bypass all these expensive um, dense layers, and we directly go to a much much smaller. Um, feature map size of 28 by 28 by 192 and after that we apply the standard dense net architecture and this architecture tends to work pretty well we observed that it gives a order of magnitude saving in terms of uh, peak ram requirement but it still works almost as well for standard image classification tasks so we evaluated our RN pool uh, operator against some standard pooling operators, and we also applied it on a variety of important tasks, and we observe how much compute requirement or RAM requirement it is able to uh, sort of, you know, uh, provide. That is like uh, to how much it can make it uh, cheaper, while in, uh, and uh, on the other end, how much accuracy does it lose? So that's what we evaluate in, in this uh, experiment section. So, uh, like you know, for uh, some standard image classification tasks, we compared our RNN pool operator against a bunch of pooling operators as well as standard techniques like standard convolution, and we also compare our model against the base uh, network. So here we selected mobile net v2 as the base architecture, which is one of the most popular architecture in the domain of efficient computer vision. And here, what we observe is that accuracy is actually slightly larger than the base network, and much better than what what you typically get out of average pooling or max pooling, etc. But when you look at the peak RAM requirement, our peak RAM requirement can be about 10 times smaller than the requirement for base network. And similarly, our uh, number of flops that we need also comes down by a factor of one third. Uh, another sort of application where we applied this technique is in the domain of visual wake word. So imagine that you have a very low end camera and then a person comes uh, in front of that camera. Maybe you want to uh, then like, you know, wake up the camera, basically like camera recognize that there is a person and then wake up the larger system. Maybe it wakes up a coffee, a coffee machine or it wakes up your laptop, right? Uh, so for this, like, you know, um, there is a wake, visual wake word data set that was proposed by by Chaudhary at all. So, and uh, there was a formal uh, competition on it. And again, one of the best method uh, that came out in this competition was mobile net V2. What we observe is that we are able to get accuracy similar to this mobile V2 architecture, but with only about 32 kilobyte of RAM. That is, while these standard methods require about 255, 250 kilobyte of RAM to get about 90 plus accuracy, 90% uh, plus accuracy, we are able to get almost the same accuracy in just about 32 kilobyte of RAM. And similarly, the amount of compute that we need also comes by a factor of uh, comes down by a factor of one third. And then, like, you know, uh, finally, like, you know, we also applied our solution in this problem of phase detection, which is uh, a fairly challenging problem because here you don't in just have to sort of recognize if there's a face in the frame or not. You also have to tell where exactly that face is. So it's a much, much more challenging task. And <clears throat> Uh, for face detection, there has been a variety of techniques that people have proposed to uh, to ensure that you can deploy solutions on reasonably tiny uh, devices. Uh, and for a variety of uh, like a large spectrum of compute devices, people have come up with uh, various methods. Using RNN pool, we are able to come up with a series of models uh, that can be deployed on these uh, uh, like you know devices with various uh, compute capabilities. So if you're talking about slightly largest models, like you know model which can support say uh, 20 megabyte or 15 megabyte of RAM. <coughs> there we observe that compared to the standard method called EXTD, we have uh, higher accuracy at least for easy and medium hard data sets uh, of this wider face validation data. Uh, while our RAM requirement is one third of this standard method and the number of compute that we need is almost a factor of five smaller. 
Similarly, when we go to the lowest denominator, that let's say if you want to deploy a solution on a M4 class device and we want to have uh, peak RAM requirement to be less than 256 of kilobyte of RAM, there we have a method called R pool phase quant, uh, which is able to provide actually accuracy better than the competitor in this category, but its peak RAM requirement is within the budget of a M4 class device. Um, and in fact, we are able to sort of ensure that uh, we can uh, deploy this uh, phase detection solution on uh, a on a real world, uh, very tiny camera. And uh, we also sort of, you know, applied our model to a variety of conference group type of scenarios. And here we observe that our model is able to pro, uh, fairly accurately predict the number of people in the conference room and also where all people are sitting in the conference room. Uh, note that uh, in this conference room, Remember scenario, there might be some people who are sitting very, very close to the camera, whereas some people who might be like really far away from the camera. So it's a very challenging scenario. And still our model is able to provide fairly good performance. And it is able to do all of that on a M4 class device, which has just about 188 kilobyte of peak RAM. And the model requires only about 110 uh, million uh, floating point operations per second. And finally, we applied our solution on this task of product detection, uh, which is also a very challenging task. Like, you know, in this image frame, you have to go and find out where all uh, these uh, multiple products are. And uh, here, fast RNCNN is sort of a state of the art method. But what we observe is that RNN pool is able to uh, to be at least like you know within 10% of this faster RCNN and is still about like 10% better than this YOLO v3 architecture, which is very popular in this domain. Uh, while when we look at the floating point operations that we need, it is like you know we are about uh, 60 to 70 x smaller than YOLO v3 as well as faster RCNN, and in terms of peak RAM requirement, also we are about uh, <clears throat> 6 to 7 x smaller. So in summary, uh, like uh, resource aware machine learning is really critical for deploying uh, artificial intelligence in real world. And in particular, IoT domain provides several high impact opportunities. Uh, the uh, approach that we have taken in this project is to come up with a new building blocks that can be deployed on these tiny devices while ensuring that the performance of the model is good. And in particular, of late, we have, we have come up with this new technique called RNN pool, which we're very excited about because it is able to bring peak uh, bring down peak RAM requirement for convolution network by 8 to 10x without a significant loss in accuracy. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you so much.